Hi, welcome to News Laundry. Now, as you know, and uh, as we keep reminding you, and as is the News Laundry uh, tagline as well, when corporations pay, corporations are served, and when the public pays, public is served. Well, today we have a guest with whom we're going to talk of an instance where it appears that when the public pays, corporations are served. Josie Joseph, welcome to News Laundry. Thank you. Just a brief introduction about Josie. Josie is currently the national security editor of The Hindu that he joined two years ago. Yeah, listen. Yeah. And before that, he was with Times of India, with Blitz, with DNA, with Rediff. And he has been a journalist for close to two decades, if I'm not mistaken. More than, yeah. More than that, yes. Uh, we'll come to that at the third part uh, of our interview. And Josie, of course, um, has got uh, a lot of awards along the way as well for his uh, brilliant uh, journalism, investigative journalism, especially in the other scam. Um, but today we're going to talk about, Josie, as I said, an instance that, has, uh, that you've recounted not in a newspaper or in an article, but instead in your book. And as people know, last week, it was because of this narration in uh, Josie's book, which I will come to the title of in a second, that uh, Jet Airways has sued uh, Josie Joseph and the publisher and the magazine in which the extract of his book was carried to the tune of 2,000 crores. Is that right? Is it 1,000 crores or 2,000 crores? So I've, I've received two different uh, high court notices, right. each for 1,000 crores each, and I think I hope the judge will decide or whoever will decide right. whether it adds up to 2,000 or the 1,000 is to be shared between the three. <laughs> right. So I, I would, uh, that's one of my questions uh, at the, the fag end of the interview, that um, or the off chance that you lose, you would have to shell out 2,000 crores, is that right? So you obviously have that money or? I don't know. They seem to, they seem to <laughs> presume that I have the money or the publishers have it. I think the amount is uh, is a direct strategy of intimidation right. to intimidate the publisher. Right. You know that if, if you lose, you go bankrupt, right? Yes. yes. Or, or the or the magazine that is carried. So I think the amount is I don't find any justification on it. Right. Uh, we can discuss it in detail. Sure. So I mean, uh, as I was saying, we have a lot to cover, Josie. Uh, uh, limited time. So I've divided the interview into three parts. In the first, we will, uh, in some reasonable detail, we'll we'll chalk out the sequence of events that you've narrated. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as the incident is concerned. And in the second part, we would uh, talk of the rebuttal, which is the legal notice that had been served to you and your response to that. And in the third, I would like to, because you also, that also features prominently in uh, Josie's book, which is the, the role of the media uh, as far as serving the, uh, the politician corporate nexus goes. So let me begin with uh, saying that Josie's book is uh, a feast of vultures. And that's one thing that actually struck me immediately was that it, it is not titled a feast for vultures, but a feast of vultures. Was that deliberate? Yes, yeah, I mean, it came out because of reason. Uh, I was providing a bird's eye view of India. If you look at India, and, and let's say you are in Spain, in, in air, uh, what you see is uh, a very minority of the elite of this country feasting on the resources, on the, on the misery of its poor, and in the name of democracy. So I thought it was a continuing feast that's, that's ongoing before I wrote the book and continuing into the Future. So it's not a feast that is ready for the uh, elite. So they, right. we are all part of the elite who are feasting on the misery of its right. poor. Right. So basically, this is a book not of uh, a feast that has been prepared for vultures that are unknown mm -hmm. that may land on the feast. But you know the vulture. So it we, is a feast are of yeah, the vultures. Yeah, yeah right. we are not. That was that was uh, a, a nice uh, wordplay there. So let's begin, Josie, with with the the first part, first section of the interview, and I think it all started uh, as you recount in your. Uh, Wonderful book, by the way. I rec highly recommend it. Uh, and incidentally, we don't have a copy here because I, I didn't want the, the viewers to confuse uh, and say, think that this interview is probably a review. It is not a review of the book. Um, the book has been in the market for the last couple of months, three months, in fact. Yeah. Uh, but this is, I want to talk strictly about the, the legal notice that has been served on the sections that were narrated by Josie in his book. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, I, I'll just help you along, but I would like you to recount um, uh, about the specific uh, incident, uh, which was that um, it all happened in 2002. And take us along, you know, the, the, uh, the IB officers in the raw when they meant to meet someone uh, in the north. Yeah, so no, I, I, actually the story of Jet Airways and, and, and uh, the entire section of, uh, you know, my book has three parts. Yeah. One segment is about 
aviation, which is the industry that I have focused on, to narrate how and how India's liberal economy played out, and how some of the icons of her, uh, of the day uh, came in from nowhere and manipulated the right. processes and the governments and systems to become rich. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I, 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 I mean, since you have read the book, you know that yes. most of the book is very active in the sense it's all stories. Right. So I wanted, I mean, you know, one of the things that was worrying me was that. There are a lot of books about contemporary India, but very few is read cover to cover. Yeah, people write. In fact, that is one of the, if I may, yeah. uh, the criticism of the book I, I may have is that it's it's too short. I was expecting. <laughs> I mean, the amount of explosive information in it, yes. you know, would, we should have made yeah. it about 700, 800 pages long. Yeah. So, so um, I, I was very clear that. Did you edit it out to you know? Did you of stick, cut off a lot of portions? Yeah. So? One of one of the first suggestions from my agent was that it actually is, are two different books. Right. I said no. I. I it should be there. So uh, I'm saying that. Uh, so since I wanted the book to be read, and and to be as gripping as possible, uh, I start in 2001 to period. Right. On that particular chapter, which is now is part yes, of the litigation, yeah. that's about J. Tervez on Naresh Goel and and. So uh, basically, what has, what happened was that one letter signed by the joint director, a joint director of Intelligence Bureau called Anjan Ghosh, yeah. uh, to the joint secretary in Home Ministry emerged in public. Yeah. Which says that uh, uh, we we have confirmed, Indian Bureau has confirmed information that there is intermittent contact between Daud Ibrahim and his people and Naresh Goel of Jet Airways. Right. In fact, as you, if I may quote you, you say there is a single page note to Sangeeta yeah, Gairola, that was Joint Secretary at the it. Union Ministry of Home Affairs, MHA, saying that his agency had confirmed information of intermittent contacts between Naresh Goel yeah. and Underwood Dons, Chota Shakil, Chota Shakil, and Daud Ibrahim to settle financial issues. There is strong suspicion that parts of Goel's investments may have uh, accrued through the help of underworld groups, prominently headed by Dawood and Chota Shakil. So, I mean, this, I would, I would have imagined this is an absolutely damning piece coming as it does from IB and RAW. You know, these are the agencies that we believe we, I mean, the public pays for these agencies to do this work. So, in, in now, fact, so what happened with this note? Yeah. So, no, uh, so there are two things here. Yeah. My chapter actually uh, brings out the entire file. Right. This is the only note that has been in public. So I, the rest of the book chapter is actually constructed around documents and notes signed yes. and numbered in a, in both Home Ministry and Indians Bureau. Right. So I'm not shooting there. So every word in that chapter yeah. is based on government documents. That is why I think it's a great fight to have in the court. Yes. Now coming to the agencies. I think because of a complete lack of uh, accountability on the part of intelligence agencies and because of the political manipulations and because of the uh, undue influence of uh, crony capitalists on the system, nothing happened. And it's not just one letter, there have been uh, dozens of intercepts uh, that showed uh, his uh, direct links with the underworld and till date he has not explained where he got the money to start his airlines from. Right. He, he got the money, a, a company called Tailwinds in Isle of Man, if I'm not wrong, brought in, uh, I think, $900,000 those days. And he has refused to explain the source of money to the authorities, saying that he's an NRI, where even when the authorities had very serious doubts about the source of the money. So it is, it is an apt case uh, for the government, uh, for any government of the day to act on, uh, to show that they're serious about cracking down criminals. It is also an apt case for a media uh, in, in deformation because uh, we are talking about uh, the, 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 the mockery of justice that has come to where from uh, an age, a corporation and its promoter who was under investigation, documented investigations, is now turning around because we have had successive governments of lousy, corrupt or inner politicians right. who did not act. Yeah. And it has come to a stage where he is now turning around to me and saying that, look, you are defaming me. Right. The documents so are I, non-existent. I, I, it's Orwellian. Yeah. So right? I, I want to go uh, you know, very slowly through the sequence. I think it's yeah. important for our viewers to understand the gravity of the situation. So uh, this letter of December 12, 2001, actually uh, emerged in the media, as you as you put it, and uh, it it and you know it, it reached the parliament. It did. It did. Parliament was told. Yeah. Parliament uh, was told, and this was during the NDA one. NDA one. Yeah. L K Adwani was a home minister. In fact, Adwani personally has to explain a lot more in this game. In that's what my chapter documents. Yes. L K Adwani and every official there has to explain what happened, and including. One of the present union ministers was involved in the conversations happening there. Now, parliament was told, and it's not just one instance, there have been several questions in the 90s about the source of Jet Airways funding. Right. 
according to documents again which I have documented in my book, there were at least four or five parliamentary assurances given by Civil Aviation Ministry and the Home Ministry saying that we are looking into it and we will act on it. And these assurances have been carrying on. The files are open even date. So it is a ridiculous situation where I, I mean, where the politicians, including the present Prime Minister, stand up there and talk about cleaning politics and doing what not. But whereas there is an industry that is, one company that has flourished under your nose. Right. With such concrete evidence. So, uh, this, uh, so none of the parliamentary uh, the, the assurances given about acting yeah. has not been acted on. Correct. So Correct. it remains a breach of parliamentary democracy yeah. processes and, and it remains an embarrassment and, and a reason for anger among a mm. lot of intelligence operatives of this country who have honestly been tracking this man and the underworld of Tawdi Brain. Mind you, we have lost hundreds of security personnel and others in trying to control this uh, underworld uh, uh, gangs of Mumbai. And it is also a fact that, I mean, all this uh, was happening right after Kandahar hijacking. That's right. So, in yeah. fact, uh, I, I so, talk about this one particular meeting. Yeah. Uh, a month after Kandahar, right. there is a meeting, the minutes of which I have again yes. highlighted in the book, yeah. uh, where the, they're talking about the security scenario and how to tighten security. And, and, and a month, uh, a few days after the meeting, Home Ministry officially, Sangeeta Gerola, who later, I think she recently retired as a secretary, she actually wrote to the, uh, the Civil Aviation Ministry saying that the Home Ministry will be the security clearance, will provide the security clearance to anyone who wants to be in aviation. Right. right? And the chapter I also show letters after letters written by the Home Ministry to the Civil Aviation Ministry re rejecting permission to individuals and companies to operate especially including individuals against whom just cases of corruption were there, right. citing that. So, for example, Captain Sadish Sharma was denied, who, of the Congress party, was denied permission to be on the board of the, you know, the Safdarjan Flying Club, saying that he has got corruption case against him. Uh, Mesco Airlines, a lot of them. In fact, I recounted a lot of letters. But there is one company on which the Home Minister and Relke Adwani had a different take, that is Jet Airways. And Intelligence Bureau Chief himself, and this is something which needs to be propped and I think it's a very serious criminal breach of India's security. It's a very serious breach of the, the, uh, the commitment to the constitution. The Indian's bureau chief, in a very unusual move, signs a letter saying that we do not have anything fresh shown in I jet. However, in the past, we have, have had evidence of these yeah, things. So this is what I want to talk about, uh, yeah. Josie, because uh, in fact, this name crops up time and again in your book, uh, K.P. Singh. So uh, uh, let's let's start off with K.P. Singh and Ghosh, uh, as you put it, uh, hurrying up to the parliament building yeah. to meet L.K. Advani. Yeah. Now they obviously were carrying the proof which yeah. the IB had, yeah. and not only, if I'm not mistaken, documentary evidence, yeah. but also phone conversations. Yes, yes. No, in fact, intercepts of Naresh Goyal's links to underworld right. start sometime in early 90s, okay. and it has gone on till date, till about till about 2005, six. Yes, there have been input with both IB and RNW, mind you, I've been covering intelligence agencies and security establishment for 20 years, and I think I've done a credible job relatively at least. So I'm not shooting in there. These are very senior officials who have been telling me about intercepts, intercepts, evidences. And I'm not, I'm not talking about anything. This is not a rocket science that I'm creating. This is something everyone knows in the system. So they were carrying intercepts files, and in fact, in the book, I talk about one person who was in that meeting actually told me when I was researching for the book, he said, I thought Jet Airways is going to be shut down in days. Because he said Adwani was so angry yeah. and parliament was in uproar, right? So now this is the question that I have, I mean the first of many questions, which is that you have these IB officials, especially Mr. K.P. Singh, and I'll come to him a bit later. Uh, so he goes along to meet Adwani yeah. and uh, people are expecting that he's going to take some action, as you say. And the next thing you know is uh, no action is taken. And then we have uh, Rajiv Pratap Rudi who is uh, uh, in the civil aviation. The and who is still aviation. a minister. Who is still a minister. Still a minister. Yeah. And he, so the one of the letters that you, you cite is December 2003, mm -hmm. where he is actually left to write to Sri L.K. Advani, essentially, I mean, in not in so many words, asking why no action has been taken. Yeah. You know, what, what he's saying is that uh, we have, uh, from MHA, we have not yet received the inputs. Uh, please put our mind to rest. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the, the letters are there in the book, so you can you know read the whole thing. And he says, I shall therefore be grateful if the process of security clearance to the reconstituted board of directors of Messrs. Jet Airways could be expedited in the Ministry of Home Affairs. Was there any response by Advani to this letter and to many other letters? 
So the response is Adwani as Home Minister did not write back yeah. to my to, to the in the files that I've seen. I've only dip, look. I even my my rendition. So of was this a charade? I mean, did did Adwani pass the buck to uh, the Civil Aviation Ministry that why don't you keep a you know Maybe, we don't know to keep don't up know. the thing that Th these people have to explain and 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 these people needs to be asked questions. I don't know what forum where because Parliament is almost like a doghouse now. Uh, what's hap what happened is that. The only letter then finally, the, the final letter that goes from Home Ministry is in two stages. One is a letter that Home, uh, that the Indian Bureau Chief is uh, putting up to the Home Secretary that where he says that uh, there is nothing new but we have had evidence of contacts with criminal underworld that he's mixed up with Daoud Ibrahim etc etc and says that basically almost giving a yes to the this meaning doesn't need any security clearance. Based on that, the final letter that goes out of Home Ministry is by one Mr. Mittal. He actually again writes saying that uh, Home Minister, I mean, Civil Aviation Ministry may decide the security clearance for Jet Airways. That's the only case of all the files that I've seen where Home Ministry actually gave the responsibility of giving security clearance to the Civil Aviation Ministry. So this is, don't you find this strange when you have the, I mean obviously the matters of the state, the security, the defense, the security of the nation uh, depends on the, the Home Minister. And especially in the aftermath of the Kandahar hijack, uh, you know, hijack, how can the Ministry of Civil, Avi Civil Aviation decide whether uh, uh, you know a company has to be given security clearance? I mean, obviously, it has to be based on IB and raw inputs that would go directly to. Correct me if I'm wrong. That should go to the Home Ministry. So where does yeah. Civil Aviation come into it? No, so so they just kept washing their hands, right? And 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 finally, want they look. It was predetermined that the security clearance, especially for Naresh Goel, must be given, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So they created the charade. They kept waiting. They delayed. In fact, that's the only application again where things are very delayed. In every other application, rejection is instant, with the CBA or IB input and rejection, right? In this case, it drags on for months, months because the parliament cools off. The attention is taken away somewhere else. Your Kandahar deaths are forgotten. You know what I'm saying? Yes. The settings is ready. So finally, they slip it in, saying that okay, you give the security clearance. Now, uh, you ask me whether I'm surprised. I'm not surprised. Actually, uh, having covered the government very closely for more than two decades and having done most of the ministries and knowing these chaps, I am not surprised. I think we are, we are a democracy which at the highest levels functions mostly because of bribe as a lubricant. Otherwise, if, if there is not enough bribe and inducement, I think the government might uh, stall. Now, uh, coming back to uh, the IB officer, IB chief, in fact, Mr. K.P. Singh, as you say, I mean, he was the person who actually took the proof to L.K. Advani. Yeah. And three years later, he, uh, he did a U-turn. Yeah, and, and, and now, what can explain that? I mean, why, why would, when you have the proof, and you, you have the letters, you have the transcripts, you have everything, why would an IB, I mean, an IB chief, suddenly go back on his word and say, well, I don't find anything wrong with that? I mean, and obviously, they didn't destroy the proof. Had he destroyed the proof, you can still say, what do you think uh, was his reasoning? KP, KP Singh is out there. He lives in Delhi, if I'm not wrong. I think he should explain. I think IB should explain. IB is not a private army or private intelligence. Yeah, absolutely, it's, it's, yeah. it's funded by the salaries yes. and the taxes that we pay. Yeah. I think the problem is that our intelligence agencies are among the rare in the world in a democracy which has no external uh, control, meaning there is no audit, there is no review of them. In, in, in most democracies, there is some kind of parliamentary oversight Hearing or, or intelligence whatever. agencies. Yeah. Yeah. We do not have it. Do you know that the intelligence, uh, so anywhere in the world, let's say CIA has uh, assets. So if, if CIA is paying an asset, it is a verifiable payment and a verifiable asset. Do you know that Indian agencies can't even, doesn't even keep record enough to verify? If an external auditor wants to audit how IBS spent 100 crore rupees last year in secret funds, there is no way that an external auditor can audit because it is all in, uh, you know, chits and uh, secret codes. But is that, is, is, I mean, would you say that's illegal or is that constitutionally allowed? Something the, the, like that? The, the or nobody has actually the Constitution it? doesn't talk about inst uh, mm -hmm. intelligence agencies, right? Yeah, yeah. So, it, in, in, you know, the, there are fundamental flaws in the Indian democracy, which is that after independence, we have not very boldly imagined an Indian concept of governance. So we have just inherited the British governance and just we have been, tank, you know, a little tampering here and there with it, nothing more. So. I don't know if it is illegal, but definitely it is, it is a cruel joke on the uh, honest taxpayer that there is no accountability and there are no questions being asked and nobody seems to be bothered. So, I mean, here is what happened. You have uh, 
the IB and the RAW officials, they have this evidence against these airlines. They take it to the Home Minister, at that point of time, Mr. Advani. Nothing happens. The Ministry of Civil Aviation writes to him, possibly this, the whole thing looks to me, at least, perfunctorily as a charade. Nothing happens. Three years later, the IB chief goes back on his word. Now the funny thing, and I'll come to that in a bit detail, uh, a little, uh, few minutes later, is that for the next 10 years, we had uh, the opposition, at that point of time, opposition, the Congress party. And you would expect, if the Home Minister has done this, if the IB chief has done this, you would expect the incoming government, which is the opposition, Congress party, it has 10 years to do something about it. It hasn't. It didn't. And actually, I think uh, over the last few decades, political parties of all, all hues have uh, developed very smart strategy of presenting the wrong story to the public. So the narration is distorted, right? What is the distorted narration that you and me hear or the ordinary people hear is that, oh, look, you know, Modi is promising a fight against corruption. He's coming with this clean guy, you know, he's coming up here. Or, or similarly, UP or Congress, right? But the real story is not that. The real story is that Indian political parties are among the world's largest black money operations. And they're far bigger than even the Mexican drug cartels. And these parties cannot act tough on any big industrial house because they need thousands and thousands of crores of black money to run their operations. So whether you call it demonetization or whether you call it uh, you know, NREG or whatever you call it, these are all tricks of the trade by the politicians who do not want the real story to, be, to reach the public. Because if the real story reaches the public, if you were to act on jet airways, then there are n number of uh, luminaries who need to be put to jail. <laughs> there are n number of bureaucrats and intelligence officials who need to be questioned. Yeah. That, 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 we that simply don't have the... Uh, no, and, and also, we don't know what other favours these people have done for the Congress party, right? Right. So it's not that Congress party is collecting fund uh, only from Mother Teresa's charity. Yeah. They are also collecting from the same pool of industrialists. So this kind of smells to me a bit like what happened in Beaufort's. You know, you have, uh, you have, uh, you know, the Beaufort scandal, which brought down a government. Yeah. And but Beaufort's was peanuts. Hmm. 64 crore rupees and yes. total just about 120 crore rupees. And it was a much simpler case, meaning you had a government, there was a middle, a few middlemen and, and somebody who was very close to the Gandhi family and that was it. But I'm saying that the larger narrative is much more complex. So if Naresh Goel is not being acted upon, uh, despite his close proximity to the India's number, the enemy number one. Yeah. It's not just commerce, it's not just, you know, that's bribe right. or corruption. Right. Right. It is security. I mean, Dawood yeah. Ibrahim. So, you know, so I, I know why he is now into the case, because yeah. th there are other governments of the world which actually do strong due diligence. Right. I know that many of them are asking questions, and they are all looking at him, and he is unable to answer those questions. Now, the funny thing is, you, I mean, you... As you say, the case against Dawood somehow did not stop, even though they went cold on uh, Mr. Naresh Goel, because you recount that uh, it was a Delhi police that intercepted a vehicle. That's it. And they caught um, a sleeper of, uh, I think, Chota Shakil. Rival. Rival. Yeah, Chota Rajan. Rival. Yeah, yeah, Chota yeah. Rajan. Yeah. And sitting next to him yeah. was the current uh, National Security Advisor, advisor Ajit Doval. Yeah. Doval. Yeah. So uh, it was very clear. Yeah that they were still, uh, you know, going, going to uh, at least try to target... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I'm hoping that the NSA, Mr. Yes. Doval would have had spent some time reading my book, right. at least looking at his extract, yeah. and he would take his uh, revenge or... Uh, he has, to be fair to Mr. Doval, he has spent considerable amount of time uh, in his professional career tracking such criminals and actions. And as you say, he nearly got him. Yeah, he nearly, nearly got, got him, him but, right. Uh, so, so I hope he will, he will act on this at least. I mean, I'm, I'm, But I'm, have any, any people... Uh, set aside politicians because they, they always meddle in these things, but any, any professionals in the IB or RAW, have they tried to sympathize or contact you after the defamation Look, I, I, I do have a uh, good number of acquaintances yeah. in agencies and various okay. security forces. Yes, retired or still? Uh, still in service okay. because I've been covering them for right. a lot, lot of time. Uh, they will, informally they are all, uh, they will know what happened, yes. right? But officially and formally, nothing has moved. Nobody has ever approached me or asked me, uh, is that so? Or saying that, look, we are looking into it. So because our governance has come to such stage, that is why I would be accused of defaming somebody who is on record caught uh, sleeping with the enemy. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm not surprised that they have not contacted me. Right. And, and the, the, as, as a quirk of fate, it's actually turned a full cycle because the, 
the the evidence was gathered during NDA one. That's right. And yeah. had had uh, Jet Airways sued you during the UPA time, you know, you could at least expect that people would go after Advani. But now, uh, you know, because <laughs> NDA two has come in, I um, I don't know what the yeah. equation between uh, Mr. Advani, Mark Dashamandal, and the present government is. But I, I, are you? Do you have any hope that the government would take it up? No, I don't have any hope. Seriously, not because of Advani or anything. Uh, the fact is that governance. Uh, in India, at the, at, especially at the highest levels and in states, uh, majorly is a mere drama. There is no honesty or integrity in our governance, especially among the political class. There are a lot of good politicians, but I am talking about political class as it is. Uh, so I don't think... Is there an all honest political party in India? In your... Uh, no, I, I, I don't think in the present political system any party can be honest. Amadmi Party is very new, so I haven't really looked at it. But even I don't think even they would be able to survive and flourish in the present political system because look at the numbers. The, the Center for Media Studies in 2014 said 30,000 crore rupees is going to be spent during Lok Sabha elections. Right. You add up all the official expenditures, even then there's a huge gap of 10, 15,000 crores. Whereas who spent it? Where has it come from? So coming back to uh, uh, you know the, the subject at hand, you write, and I quote, these exchanges, which is the correspondence and you know the, the material, uh, documentary evidence, between the various departments have remained buried in government files for years and would have been there forever had not a contact of mine handed them over to me at great personal risk. So the next question is, uh, presumably this is, uh, unless uh, you, know, you settle with Jet Airways, which the chances are, I mean, I don't, I don't really know. I'll come to that in the third part. Um, because a par an aggrieved party did try and settle the case with you uh, on some other subject matter after intimidating you. But in this case, um, if you don't settle, it would go to court. Uh, would the court ask you to reveal this source? No, I don't think so. I don't think... Uh, what if the court says, I mean, it happened to, if you remember, uh, three or four years ago in New York Times, I mean... Uh, so uh, the, we have it, yeah, in, the, in, in the US, yeah. the, 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 source of the, uh, the source of information is very crucial in the, their jurisprudence. Okay. In India, it is not. So when Prasant Bhushan's case, when he submitted the Ranjit, uh, the CBI director's diaries, those... those right, yeah. yes. So court, though court asked and when he refused, so I don't, I don't, I don't need to prove. It is the... But isn't that still going on? I mean, that's not... No, but not court has not insisted on revealing okay. of the source. Okay. Uh, in India, but the would you say would you reveal it? I no, mean, no, 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 you no, wouldn't. no, 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 I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Sorry, I mean, you know, that's no. I, uh, two things. You also spoke about compromise. There is no compromise here. Yes. He has gone to the court now. We will settle it on our terms, right? Right. I mean, and, and settlement is not about uh, a settlement with the terrorists. Settlement would be in terms of uh, what the court would decide about the what what the documents should be done to. I mean, what should be done to these documents? So there is no compromise that uh, I don't think I can see any compromise, even if it takes some uh, toll on my financial uh, health. Uh, no, I am saying that in India, the responsibility is not on me to prove that the documents are not fake. It is on the other side to prove that it is fake. Right. Right. And I don't need to, in Indian courts, reveal my sources, and I do not intend to, even if court forces me to. Because these are documents that have been given to me by officials who have spent a lifetime honestly trying to track criminals and criminal gangs and underworld which is threatening the very idea of India. Yes. And you know, I, in fact, one of the very senior officials who dealt with this case, I went to meet him, a retired old man who lives with great taste, you know, collection of old archaeal artifacts and all that. After meeting, he told me, Joseph, can I make a request? I said, Sir. he said, don't quote me. Second thing, don't reveal where I live. Right. A senior official who is to be in the security establishment. That's a, that's a, that's a reality of this country. Did he have any security? Uh, no, he was thing? living in, I mean, it's, it's quite sad, you know, I mean, to see a man of that stature telling me, listen, don't reveal where I live. So do you believe that after, let's say, uh, you know, on, on the face of it, selfless service by a lot of IP, raw officials, uh, you know, hard grind, yeah. um, after they retire, they just they just become expendable. They're left in the lurch. Do you do you yeah. have do you get this thing that you know they've they've served the country? That and uh, even violent service. Do you, do you do you think that uh, there are nobody who is still watching the jet airways and marriage goals of the world? There are people, young people, senior people in the agencies who are honestly watching these people. They're tracking right and now. Even now, because intercepts. Do you, you know? I mean, I I I, uh, uh, I I I mean, when I cover intelligence, one of the things that I try to do is as far as possible to rely on uh, technical in intercepts and other things, not to go by what the return sources have said. 
So I did a project about last year on Dawood Ibrahim to see what is Dawood's influence in India using only intercepts. Okay, so I went right. to various agencies. I convinced a lot of people. And look, it's not an easy task. You are listening in on dozens, hundreds of phone calls, and from that they distill out the number that is being used by him or his people, and then you collect proof. And and what what does the government of the day do? Throw them into the uh, dustbin. That's it. So in fact, so moving on in the sequence of events, uh, the governments uh, changed. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh became the prime minister. And here you uh, very interesting. You you talk about the the contacts or the connections of Dawood, and you and I quote, a union minister in Dr. Manmohan Singh's UPA government, which was in power between 2004 and 2014, had been exchanging notes with Dawood through a resident of South Delhi, who was also suspected to be a bookie, manipulating cricket games. According to several intercepts by Raw, over the years. The bookie had been negotiating through the minister for Dawood's return to India. Yeah. I mean, that is, uh, it's just incredible. That's the reality of India. That is modern India. And, I mean, what, and the minister that can we, one say? Uh, the minister that we are talking about yeah. is a very senior Congress leader. Right Congress. now? Even now? Or yeah, is yeah, yeah. Okay. And he's not the only senior politician in India who, is, who has been in direct touch with yes, contact you, with Dawood, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there is there is a you very talk famous about a prominent regional political satrap from UP. Yeah, um, yeah. Through courier sent sent from Mumbai, used to get contacts that's from Dawood. That's it. Now, um, the another explosive thing that I so you know, mind you, I mean, yeah. for a lot of these people, Dawood is a big businessman too. You know what I'm saying? That is, it's not that they are all conspiring to destroy India. Right. But Dawood is a big businessman. Dawood has been trying to, through the minister, telling that I am willing, I want to come back to India, that's my motherland, that's where I want, because here in Mumbai he was a king. Not in, in, in Pakistan, he's in house arrest, virtual house arrest, right? Yeah. So he has, been, he has been offering to come to India and spend some time in jail. He wanted a guarantee that he won't be given capital punishment. Right. That was his only condition. Okay. And then, I mean, one of the things, uh, uh, one of the many explosive things is also, when the government changed, um, you actually, uh, you talk about Sharad Pawar and uh, Praful Patel. Um, and you, I mean, I would have thought that more than Jet Airways, these guys uh, would be more worried about the revelations that you make. Because, I mean, immediate, they kind of, as you say, they insisted to get the Civil Aviation Ministry. Yeah, that's, this um, I haven't quoted from many uh, rumor mill. These are all documents out there. Right, these are documents and various kinds so of Sharad reports. So Sharad Pawar wanted the civil aviation. That's what uh, the security establishment's uh, filings of the day show. And uh, lo and behold, when he gets the civil aviation ministry. And see what happened. Yeah. See what happened over 10 years. Air India was reduced to a bankrupt eh, company that nobody wants. It's, it's very, very, very profitable routes were handed over to uh, private companies to run. And, and uh, a, a, a mind-bogglingly foolish uh, loan was imposed upon that company, and there is nobody being held accountable. Can you believe that in a private sector somebody will do like that? A company with 7,000 crore, 8,000 crore rupee turnover was asked to take a loan of 60,000 crore rupees of the interest service alone would, wouldn't it be possible by the company. You think any private company will let anybody take a decision like that and get away? And you know what? There is, there is a man called... Uh, uh, Jidendra Bhargav, he used to be a director in Air India, he wrote a book. And he, that poor chap is facing defamation case in Mumbai, filed by Praful Patel. And that old man is running around for help. So, uh, I mean, let, uh, before I come to the second part of the interview, which is to talk about the, the lawsuit in some detail, just to end, it seems, I mean, I don't want to give the viewers any impression of that Josie is an eternal pessimist and, you know, do you see a way out? I mean, do, do you, do I you think, think so. the glass I th is one-tenth full or one-fifteenth full? I mean, it no. seems to me, reading your book and, you know, the, the events that have happened across governments, there seems to be no hope. I mean, these guys are just, they will get away scot -free. No, the mainstream political system is, is here uh, like this and it can't change much. But in the long term, I'm extremely optimistic about India. That's why I wrote the book and that's why I dedicated this to my daughter and her generation is a fact that uh, we are the youngest country in the world, you know, the median age is just 25.2 and, and with a young population of that size 
and that aspiration and that dreams, I don't think you can suppress and carry on with the mafia type of uh, governance for too long. Right. So now coming back to the, the lawsuit, which is uh, a 30 page document. And can I just say that uh, it with, is- With hundreds of pages of annexes. Yeah. Uh, of annexes. <laughs> and can I just say that it is uh, surprisingly well written. Uh, so I don't know who's vetted it. Uh, you have any idea? Yeah, of course. It is in, in Mumbai courts, mm -hmm. uh, when you file a document, yeah. the people who vet it, uh, they are named. Right. And uh, among the people, I think, is Harish Salve. Okay. So Harish Salve is yeah. uh, his good command over English. Let's just put it that way. And uh, one of the interesting things, maybe, of the the the, the forthcoming editions of your book, is to actually uh, maybe annex the uh, the lawsuit uh, to your book itself, <laughs> because <laughs> it's an astonishing piece of uh, I won't call it literature. But uh, uh, you know, of, of document on its own. I mean, it, it goes in um, kind of weird detail as to uh, what the guidelines for a journalist should be. Uh, you know, about ten pages are dedicated to the Press Council of India guidelines for uh, how a journalist should behave. Really? I mean, I, 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 seriously, I've know. been so busy traveling. <laughs> I mean, I haven't. Type, you no, haven't my, seen? my lawyer must All have right. gone through it. Okay. I haven't seen it. I, I'll, I'll sit down during the Christmas break because it's a good <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> way to spend my time, maybe. Yeah. I look at it, yeah. but uh, but I mean, this is clearly intimidation. Why, why, why would you why would you uh, basically reiterate the PCI guidelines in a lawsuit, trying to tell a journalist as to what you should and what you should not do? But you know, Anand, what happens is that when even the cleverest lawyer drafts, yeah. he leaves behind a lot of trail. Right. I had a quick read of the document, mm -hmm. and they actually rely upon a judgment of Mumbai High Court of 2007. Yes, I was coming to that. Right? Yes, yeah. Saying that a, 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 a journalist called Furkan filed a court case yes. demanding CB inquiry against Jet Airways for underworld links. Right. And a bench of two judges, yeah. Swatandra Kumar and uh, one more, uh, had dismissed the demand. But luckily, they pointed out the case, and I was looking at the documents yesterday. We are, some of some friends have been helping me, and you know what? Central government has actually filed an affidavit in the same case, saying that we are looking into the allegations. My God! So, so <laughs> even the most expensive uh, law brain, legal right. brain, won't be able to just whitewash all the truth around it. So I, that's what I told you in the beginning earlier. Also, I'm there is no compromise here. Mm -hmm. It's a fight, and it's a legal fight, and I wish, I wish, and I want to have a. Uh, ringside view of what really happens when you field expensive lawyers. Yes. So, in fact, let me just begin by, uh, you know, so they're like about 30 or 40 points. It's almost like a patent, you know, that's how you write a patent. And in one of the things they say that uh, more often than not, the complaints against Jet Airways have been based either on gossip or rooted in malice, are outright false. And they say the said book appears to be a publication based upon intelligence files of the government, mm -hmm. which obviously in an illegal manner has come into the possession of the author. Now, the point is, why should they be concerned about whether it is a, the manner to which the documents have They should also be bothered about the fact whether that they are illegal or legal. They should be also be bothered about the fact that I'm not bothered by their notice, right? <laughs> and I'm not threatened. They should go to the court and tell them that, listen, uh, judges, this fellow is not going silent. He's still talking, right? They should also be bothered about the fact that thousands of people are buying my book. It has topped the Amazon's annual list of nonfiction sellers. Right. The the fact is also that there are, I, I'm, on a daily basis I'm I'm getting hundreds of messages from people. There are people groups which want to fund my legal fight, which I am saying no. There is somebody who wants to make a movie on me. So they should actually be bothered about the fact that far too many people are bothered about the truth, and that should worry them. Right. So a couple of things that I mean I found kind of interesting. I'm not a lawyer, um, thankfully, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, they uh, repeatedly seem to be harping on the point that. The proof that um, the IB and the RAW collected, um, what they're saying is that after a period of time, the IB chief essentially went back on uh, you know, the proof that they had collected. Now, how would you, as a defendant, uh, counter that fact, saying that we, we, we had proofs and then the IB itself has actually uh, reneged maybe, on. May, 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 I don't, I, look, I haven't had a sitting with my jet, uh, lawyer because I've been traveling for the litfest and other things. Right. Uh, I would be, so I don't know the specifics of the legal fight, but I would presume that if the IB chief of the day has gone back or the agency has gone back, I think maybe they should also answer, they should answer the question, no? Not me, right? I'm bringing all the documents, but I can tell you from whatever I've gone through, the lawyers have no clue what I have in my hand and I have much more than they can imagine. 
So, and as you were just saying, you preempted me because I wanted to talk about the High Court case yeah. in the 2006 and PIL that was filed. And the, these lawyers seem to be harping on the fact that, you know, the, the High Court has dismissed it. Yeah. But now what you're saying is that actually the government, of all people, the government has actually said we're going to file an affidavit against the No, dismissal. the government has actually filed an affidavit. They've already filed the affidavit, yeah. In 2007, okay. saying that we are looking into these allegations. Okay. Indians and security agents are looking into allegations. So we would have a curious case where the company against which the government is still looking into the allegations oh. and the matter is sub judice, the same company has filed a defamation suit saying that... Of course. Uh, we, are, we, we, we live in very interesting times. Almost Orwellian, right? So uh, the fact is also that no intelligence agency in this country and no security establishment in this country can ever say that they've closed the case on jet airways because Unfortunately, it is one of the most well-documented of the cases. And today, that is a case that is globally being investigated. Uh, and one other thing that I found, um, so essentially these are the, uh, 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 this is what the, the case against Josie is, that the plaintiff's number one business activities had allegedly been funded or through such alleged underworld connections. The above alleged linkage has been established by various investigative reports. The above alleged linkage was investigated and established by various regulatory authorities, such as the Ministry of Home Affairs. And despite the same, plaintiffs have allegedly succeeded by reason of their alleged political connections from action being taken against them. These are the four points on which they have filed this defamation suit. The other thing that I found um, quite interesting was that uh, they sent a letter to you before they, uh, they were actually uh, the legal notice. Um, dated 28th July, if That's I'm not right, mistaken. Yeah. Um, and they sent it to your publisher as well. Yeah. And uh, what they said, the publishers, uh, what the publisher said was kind of worried me a little because if you remember the background of how the publishers have behaved in this country, if you remember the, uh, the Wendy Doniger's book, yeah, yeah, The Hindus, mm -hmm. you know, they simply published it. Just, yeah. So here the publisher said that we have published the book in good faith, relying upon the representations made by the defendant number one, which is the author. So is this kind of a get out clause by the publisher saying that, look, we have, we take no responsibility, uh, you know, we have published it, relying upon the, I mean. Uh, but you, you know, the, you, you know the, the author and the publisher, the agreements are very clear. I am responsible for every word that appears there. Right. Right, but every author signs that. And we must appreciate the fact that publishing is not a very profitable business. Yeah. Right, it's a low margin business. So that's understandable. And I do not expect Harper Collins to, uh, uh, to, to produce any evidence. Mm -hmm. They don't need to. I have enough and more and I'll do it. I mean, and the only contact that I've had with Harper is of them standing by me. In fact, the book demands are going up. So they right. seem to I'm be not, happy. I mean, the point I'm making, Josie, yeah. is that, I mean, they, they may come in eventuality. I, probably hope it doesn't, but they may when you might be asked to fight this case alone. I mean, Harper Collins would say, I mean, judging by their response to the first letter, yeah. they say that, look, this is, we published it. And uh, again, I repeat, I hope it, it shouldn't happen like Penguin, they pulped, uh, you know, the, the Hindus. Um, Harper Collins say, well, we, you know, we leave it to the author. Do you think, I mean, do you worry about this eventuality? No, no, no. You don't. No, I don't think so. I don't. In fact, a lot of people have been wanting to see me worried. Right. A lot of people are very surprised when they meet me that I'm not worried. You know, I'm not worried. Even if nobody fights, I'll fight this case. This is my fight. And I, I, I intend to fight this case with my money, my resources, and my time. If any famous lawyer comes to help me, that will be welcome. I do not intend to take money from anybody else. And No even political party? No, nothing, no. Uh, even if nobody wants to stand by me, whether it's publisher or Outlook magazine, I would not be upset with them. I would expect, I'm hoping that they will be together in the fight. In fact, one of the interesting things was um, uh, this about the lawsuit was uh, tweeted and commented upon by Dr. Subramaniam Swami. That's right. Yeah. Um, and because I think Dr. You, Swami... You, you, and re you retweeted his tweet as well. That's right. So, so if he decides to represent you? It would be a good thing, no? Mm -hmm. Dr. Swami commands presence in the Indian courtrooms and, right. you know, uh, leaving aside the nitty gritties of his politics, you have to... He have actually to said, if not in so many words, that Jet Airways has been stupid to file this. Yeah, so do you yes. know one more thing? Yeah. That there is an open PIL, which is mm -hmm. underway in Supreme Court, filed by Supriyana Swami, where he has accused of similar things against Jet Airways. Yes, yes. Right? about the Etihad... Uh, That's right, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I'm saying that, listen, this is, this is a fight where, uh, whether it's Dr. Swami or whether it's the Congress people, whether it's Ahmadi party, everybody has to be with me. Right. Right? At least 
for, in, for the public consumption, right? Nobody's going to say, no, 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 you know, the Ahud and Jet are not friends. Right. Nobody's going to say that, right? So now what is required, that is public perception. Within the courtroom, what does the judiciary require? A modern jurisprudence requires evidence. And I am not giving gossip. I am not even producing intercepts or video recordings. I am bringing you numbered government files signed by officials. And Jet Airways and its lawyers have no clue what I am going to bring in. Because I will bring in, I am not bringing one page which is unsigned. That is what happened in the 2007 PL. I am bringing you voluminous evidence. And then let us see what happens to it. And I, I want to enjoy that. So now, <laughs> about enjoying, I don't quite know. But uh, you know, the, the other thing that I, that I found quite strange about this whole case is that because you'll be bringing in original documents, uh, there might come a time where Jet Airways might actually sue the government of India. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's, what the lo that's where the logically should go. Yes. And Jet Airways might actually go to law courts around the world, right. again suing government of India and me and others because it's an international airline now. Right. It has got business partners all over the world. Right. It has got institutional investors. It's a publicly listed company. Mm -hmm. So it is no more about one individual called Naresh Goyal. Yes. It is about lacks their of investors, yeah. the their reputations. Because yeah. I am, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I will not, I don't want to disclose now. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people globally who are reaching out to me. Right. Because of the book. Because essentially, what you've done is you've just uh, tabled the documents, That's the it. government of India documents. That's it. So, uh, I mean, this is yeah. one of the vagaries of thing. And, you know, uh, in the, just to finish the second yeah. uh, uh, part of the, the interview uh, and uh, briefly go on to the, the final part. But before that, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, what struck me was that if you had, uh, for example, like what probably Chitra had done during Beaufort's and uh, many other investigative journalists had done is published not a book, but before that, you know, given a series of articles in newspapers. Do you think, looking back, that would have probably um, scared Jet Airways a little bit more? Because I, I mean, I get the impression that if a newspaper were to print it, companies don't really go after. Do, do you feel that? I mean, if 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 this had if, if this had come as a series of let's say twenty articles in Hindu. Um, so Anand, uh, uh, I mean, why this need for you to write a book on it? So you know, I, I have an, a folder in my email called the Morgue. Yes. Where I keep my dead stories. And over the last two year, two decades, I've collected enough dead stories that I've not seen the light of the day in mainstream newsrooms. So the, my book came out of my frustration with the limitations and censorship that I suffer in my mainstream job, right? So it is very clear. And you do suffer it. You you have of course, of course. You no, have no, instances no. where you know editors just say, "Look, we." No, can't in fact, I, 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 of all the jobs, Hindu is the first job where I have I made to suffer uh, any censorship. Okay because it's a more uh, value-driven company. I mean, that's what my sense is in the last year and a half. But otherwise... Times of India? I don't want to take names, right. but it is consistent across all newsrooms. Mm -hmm. And mind you, self-censorship imposed in the newsroom. Censorships of the kind that the advertiser, the business interests of the owners, the politics of the editors all impose is very severe. Young reporters out there are frustrated, right? So I, my book is a, is a result of those frustrations. And I did not write the book after taking advance from some publisher. I did not take, write the book with a fellowship. I wrote the book with my money and my sweat and my time, my family's vacations, right? When I wrote it, I was very clear if the mainstream publishers don't publish it, I will self-publish it. One condition was that I will not censor the book, right. all right? So these are stories if you go, because I've uh, tried to write a literary non-fiction to the best that it's possible of me, you, you will have to stop and think how many stories are out there which mainstream newspapers will publish or won't publish. Right. Right? So everything is going according to my plan. What I did not plan was that I will get such a great case to fight. Yes. Right? Because it's a perfect case for me to fight. There is no, I mean, if you look at the responses that's coming, not one person is condemning me. Yeah. Right? Now, you know, the, the, coming to the final part of the interview, which, uh, I mean, you, you talk uh, in, briefly about it in your book, which is the role of media and how journalism yeah. is uh, basically entrenched in this whole nexus. Yeah. And I would have actually preferred, uh, I mean, th that actually stands as a separate book in itself. There are so much. So I, I would like you to recount this, your meeting um, uh, with, some, with a journalist uh, in Khan Market. What well, that's, that's on the back cover of my book, right? Yeah. So if you look at my book, I haven't even taken endorsements from uh, famous writers, which is standard. Yes. So you should know the book is my product. Yes. And um, this is not for the camera or for right. to impress you. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I've already made up my mind years ago. 
in 2067 that I'm going to, book is going to be mine, the fight is going to be mine, right? Uh, so that's only one instance where a, where a journalist and PR or working for a very big corporation which was involved in a scandal comes to me offering to buy, uh, basically they had sent me a criminal defamation suit. And Not a civil, criminal one. Criminal, mm -hmm. and they, all, they also named the owners of the newspapers which created some immediate uh, scare in the office. Right. Uh, so once we stood our ground, and because I had the documents, they changed the tactics and they came back and said, look, you know, we are sorry about sending the notice. Now, can you please keep quiet because we are in the market to raise funds. Right. And uh, to keep quiet, they were offering me a house and a car, or whatever, whatever I wanted. But now, uh, Anand, that's not the only occasion. I have been, uh, through my career, if I, st if I had collected all the offers that I got, probably I would have personally had a thousand crores to pay off. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's, I mean, so two questions immediately arise. I mean, this, this is not a rare occurrence. No. I mean, you know, reading that there are, so how, I mean, in your estimate, you don't have to name, uh, it'll be nice if you name, but you don't have to name, but in, in your estimate, how many, how many journalists have actually succumbed to this percentage? Percentage, I think uh, uh, in the senior generation, yeah. many have. Many have. Many have. And some Would you say 20%? Maybe more because uh, because uh, some of the some some of the very famous names have. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. If you remember uh, the Mitrokin archives recently released, I mean, they said they were at one point of time they were seventeen hundred on their uh, payrolls. <laughs> so I'm saying that what has happened is that uh, many journalists uh, have also become so is there intermediaries. A switch? Is this a switch that happens? I mean, you know, you obviously you would very quickly ascertain that you know you are in a very powerful position That's and right. you're exposing. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, and any businessman worth his yeah. or her salt, yeah. uh, a corrupt businessman, would like to buy this thing out and withhold the information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, what happens in a journalist's mind is what I'm trying to get at, you know. So it's you know, easy for you to Yeah, both, say bo yes. both morality and uh, excellence are very lonely pursuits. Yes. You can't do it in a crowd. Yeah. So even my wife wouldn't know if I'm taking a bribe from somebody, Correct. right? Correct. And, uh, you know, mind you, when you are a journalist with access to powerful information, you don't need to do anything. Just your silence will fetch you good sum, right? The promise that you will not write a story is enough for somebody to pay you a few crore rupees. So it's a very easy game to play. And there are people who play because I've had personal experience of a few of them. Uh, but having said that, there is equally large number or more of senior journalists and especially the junior ones who are very honest and who are standing up. And I, sure. I think that's, that's a turning point. The tide is turning. The old ways of journalism being fixer in the evening and an editor in the morning, all those are going away. You know? So this is the impression that many would like to give, or yeah. many indeed give, which is that the old journalism, you know, we would have the old way, honest, this and that. You don't believe that, right? No, I don't think so. I don't think, I think, I think. Do you think honesty in journalism has grown or has it, it receded? It, it, no, it, it, two things are happening. Honesty is going up uh -huh. and uh, uh, intellectual depth is going, uh, meaning going down, meaning right. it, it's two things are on the two opposite directions. Uh -huh. uh, but I think there is an effort to uh, capture back both the uh, integrity of journalism, especially by the, in the, among the youngsters, and also in mainstream newsrooms, uh, I think television journalism came and disrupted uh, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, the growing intellectual depth of the profession. And, and, but then, but those echo chambers are going to disappear, I think. And now, I think there's, there's one thing that, I mean, I, it's abundantly clear from, you know, your book and your articles as well, that I think you, you're probably not the person who would like to go into uh, TV journalism. And uh, not a lot of investigative journalists do that is the reason is because they uh, writing for print or writing allows investigative reporting you know the 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 dust of thoughts to settle to kind of you know you introspect a little bit more you kind of otherwise it's not this you know 24 hour rush into i have exposed this i have exposed this so you wouldn't like to be a tv journalist you would uh, not in the present format in mm -hmm. fact a lot of people keep calling me with job offers uh, yeah. I think so has Arnab called you for a job offer? Uh, no, no, not, not yet. yet. But I hope he doesn't call me because <laughs> I, I, I don't think uh, I want to even engage in a conversation about journalism with him. Right. Uh, but uh, the fact is that uh, television journalism and investigative journalism in television has come down to either hidden cameras mm -hmm. or taking on very, uh, you know, being the, uh, the, the lap dog of an establishment. 
Uh, I do not believe in it. I think we have. To, you I mean, don't believe in spy cam and. Uh, sting no, I, ha I haven't used it till date. Uh, sting, mm -hmm. I don't. I have, but there are. Sting has its uh, valid mm -hmm. places, and it has to be carefully chosen. But today, it is being used to trap USHOs and constables and all that. You know, it's right. Crap. So it's very crappy. So I, I mm -hmm. find it very unimpressive. The second thing is, I, I one of the things that I like to do is to document, and I think in this country, what we lack is documentation. So, in fact, one of the things that I'm going to do in the rest of the legal case serials is I'm going to make public all the documents that I've collected for the book. It right. runs into about 15,000 of them. Yes. And, and probably I will create a tutorial for at least reporters to understand how do you navigate databases. Right. So, uh, television journalism as it is today is uh, too much of noise, very little of journalism out there. It's more entertainment to an extent. Yeah. And, and some of the senior anglers are beginning to look caricatures of themselves. So, I don't want to be there. But I'm very fascinated by visual media. Mm -hmm. So I, there was a time when I used to watch a lot of in, uh, documentaries, frontline documentaries and other kinds. So uh, I wish I would, and there are some opportunities now because the book coming up uh, where I might be involved in some kind of documentaries. But maybe, maybe I, I wish I play a role in redefining television as a medium in India because uh, this is not television is capable of. Television is capable of just going beyond studio discussions. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful medium. Now, one thing that actually struck me, uh, you know, ever since this lawsuit came along, was that you said something very interesting and something which is, um, I don't know, set you apart, which was you said, I would, I'm going to fight this case because I want to look at, in the eyes of my 13-year-old daughter. Of course. Of course. I don't want to be an old man uh, with the only child turning around to say, what have you achieved in your life, right? I'm not going to be rich. Uh, I don't want to be a politician. But you do realize, I mean, having said that, yeah. what you said uh, has immense power, but at the same time, it has a little bit of pathos as well. I mean, you might lose. I could. That's okay. If, if that is what India's modern jurisprudence dictates, judiciary dictates, I'll take it up. But I think, I, I, I don't think uh, the, 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 the legal system can ignore truth and such uh, strong documentation. So I'm very confident of my documentation. You know, Anand, you must understand that I'm probably that one journalist who has received the maximum number of uh, uh, legal notices in this country and privileged notices, right? Anil Ambani once asked me to pay the 5,000 crores, you know, things like that. Ridiculous notices usually always came in my career. This is the first time that somebody is going to court. And it is not because he's on a strong wicket. He's going to court because he's under desperate fight. I mean, probably it is for them a survey, fight for the survival. Because Unlike Indian government, which often looks like a banana republic, there are governments outside in the world which are giving access to the terrorists and there are partners out there and investors out there who are saying, what man, what has happened? We didn't know this. Such detailed documentation. Right? So I'm not worried at all. And for my daughter, you know, she's a very strong girl. Mm -hmm. So she's, she enjoys every moment of my fight. So I, 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 I'm not for a moment do I think about losing. So in fact, the other day some journalists came and asked me, sir, can I ask you something? What if you lose the case? Mm -hmm. I said, who said I got 1,000 crores? They're saying, no, I don't have it. So then you'll go to jail. I said, if I go to jail, I go to jail. I may write a book from there, <laughs> right? So I'm, I'm saying that I, after an age and having uh, made compromise with the fact that you can't be very rich by doing honest journalism in this country, um, having made the determination that you are going to tell the truth without varnish and censorship in a book in your own terms, I can't now turn around and say, oh, man, you know, I'm, I'm frightened. You know, I don't have another choice. I will have to fight. If not for anything else, I will have to carry out the fight to impress my daughter. Well, Josie, a pleasure talking Thanks, to you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. You. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, this was the first uh, interview uh, given by Josie Joseph after he, he got presented with this lawsuit. Um, subscribe to News Laundry. And remember, as we said, when corporations pay, corporations are served. And on most occasions, when the public pays, the public is served. This was a one-off, and I hope it doesn't last. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you like that, click here to support us, and down here to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and do check out the other stuff we do, like News Laundry interviews, Why So Serious, animations, comics, panel discussions, podcasts, which are really big, and much, much more.